What a great song for us as we uh, press into the names of God, remembering that um, uh, ultimately where this entire series is going with the names of God, describing the character of God, ultimately uh, that points to Jesus, right? So, so Jesus is that coming one. Remember I, I talked about last time that God says, uh, make no uh, idols, no image of me because I am going to give you the proper image and that is I'm gonna send my son and he will be that. Uh, I'd like for you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. I'm not going to start there, but that's where we're going to do our heavy lifting, and I want you to be able to have it in front of you uh, because the, uh, the name of God tonight that we are going to look at is Adonai. Adonai. And uh, it first shows up in Genesis 15. So you hold your spot there. But I will begin in Isaiah chapter 6. So I I want you to hear uh, Adonai given in this context, okay? In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on the throne lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. You see, in our scene, in this scene here in Isaiah chapter six, uh, the, the country is mourning. They are down because the king has died. Great turmoil in the ancient world when there was a turnover of the king. Who, what the next king is going to be like, there's political unrest. It, it was massive chaos for the country. But in this vision, right, Isaiah the prophet says, yes, King Uzziah had died and the, and, the, and the world was shaken, our whole world was shaken, but I was able to look up above, high above King Uzziah's throne and I saw a greater throne and Adonai sat upon it. See, Adonai, this name for God, is a name that means king or owner or master. Psalm 97 verse 5 says that he is the Adonai of the whole earth. He is the Lord of the whole earth. Psalm 50 verse 10, he says, every beast of the forest is mine and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all mine. Why? Because he is the owner. He is the master. He is king. Now, I'd like to contrast that idea with a poem that very much well captures modern man. You've probably heard it. You might have memorized it in high school. It's called Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul." See, this poem captures and champions the human spirit. It celebrates independence and self-sufficiency. It it claims a godlike sovereignty. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I am the king who rises above. The Bible offers a completely different reality. Elohim, 
the mighty one who created it all. Yahweh, I am who I am. I always have been the eternal, the one who was and is and is to come, the self-sustaining one, Elohim, Yahweh, he is also Adonai. That is the king who owns it all and the king who reigns above it all. Now, what's very important for us to understand with this idea of Adonai, Lord, Master, King, is that it is also accompanied. You and I, we, we, take in, we think in such uh, human, uh, simplistic terms. We, you, you think of King, you think of the one who has all the power, all the authority, right? But What is conveyed in this idea is simultaneously the responsibility to care for those under their jurisdiction, right? A good king, okay, is one who provides for and protects and guides those under his care, okay? In other words, it says everything about the kind of king that you are based on if your people are flourishing. Are your people cared for, protected? Are they happy? Are they living an abundant life? Then you would say, well, I want that king. That is incredibly important because In Genesis 15, that is the sort of use that gets invoked right here at our first introduction to the title, Adonai. So, in Genesis 15, Abraham has already left the land of Ur because God spoke to him and told him, get up and go to the land that I will show you. And now he is in the promised land. And in fact, he's been there for 10 years, okay? Genesis 15, one and two. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, Yahweh Adonai. Okay, he adds Yahweh Adonai. What will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Pause right there. So you get the the context here is Abraham has been faithful and obedient. He he got up, he he left the land, and he is now in the promised land. He, He had done all that the Lord had told him. It is 10 years later, he's in the land, and guess what? Abraham is 85 years old, okay? He's 85 years old. So he begins and he replies, he says, Yahweh, right? You are the God who revealed yourself to me. You are the eternal one. No one, you are who you are. The one who was and is and is to come. You are the great I am. But he replies to him, Yahweh Adonai, okay? That is, you are also my king. You are my Lord, my master. You are my owner, okay? I am under your leadership. I am under your kingdom. I am a reflection of your kingship. And then he unfolds his problem by saying, I don't have an heir. The best I got is a distant relative. And what does God do in return? Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and he said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars that if you are even able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Right? God 
reply, God responded to Abraham's plea. And you can see it, it's embedded right there in the use of the names. If I am under your kingdom and you are a good king, now I can bring my request to you, trusting that you care deeply about what it says about the kind of king that you are and the way that you care and, and uh, protect and provide for those that are yours. Then it goes on, and in verse eight, again, he replies to him, after he had seen all the stars in the sky, in verse eight, Abraham said again, Yahweh Adonai, how will I know that I will possess this? Because you know what he's thinking. I'm 85 years old. Sarah's 75. This isn't looking good. How will this, how will I know that this will actually take place? And then the Lord makes a covenant with him. And the Lord makes a covenant with him. What I want you to see embedded here, right? That is in the midst of Abraham's submission and acknowledgement, God, you are my king, you are my protector, you are my provider, and I surrender to you, okay? I know, uh, what I want you to see is God's immediate response was not only to respond to it, but the second time he did so, Abraham knew God more intimately than ever before. God cut a covenant with him. He was more blessed. He experienced the reality of God more than he ever had before, okay? By saying, you are the king, you call the shots, I surrender to you, you have the final say. God will disclose himself to us as we surrender, okay? Now, I want you to think about how shallow Western Christianity has become when we say that we only want God to get us to heaven, but we don't want him to own us on earth. In other words, your experience and knowledge of God is directly tied to your willingness to call him Adonai, to say, you are my king, you are my Lord, I surrender to you. Be king over my thoughts, be king over my time, be king over my talents, be king over all of my treasure. I surrender it all to you. Your experience of God is tied to your willingness to surrender to him. And he has a name for that. It's called Adonai, that he is the king, that he is the Lord, right? And as we bow our knee, rather than Invictus, I'm saying, I am the captain of my soul. I will determine my path. We say, oh, no, 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 no. I've got a king. I've got a maker who is so good, who is so magnificent, who fills my soul. And I willfully bow my knee to him because he provides for me and protects for me. He does way more for me than anything else ever could. He is the delight of my soul. Will you pray with me? We cry out to you, Adonai. Yahweh Adonai. There is no one like you. We have tasted and we have seen that you are good, that you have given your son for us so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Adonai, Kurios, Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We willfully call you Lord. And we ask, Father, for your Spirit's continued presence to help us to live that out. 
We know that in moments like this, with, with our mind and even with all of our strength right now, we can call you Lord. But, but Father, our wills are strong. And, and throughout life and, and throughout temptation, we easily forget we want to live and walk out as if you are Lord, because you are and you are good. Help us to drink that truth in deeper and deeper. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.